welcome in everybody. Hello. <laughs> Today we have a trio of people going. Miss Sarah's audio is currently off right now because we messed up and have to come back and redo banter. <laughs> It was my fault. I didn't have my mic up or something. We don't know. We, I just we think that you weren't on. sitting close enough to the microphone, so it wasn't like picking you up. It it entirely could be. You never know about me. I'm you know old and I don't mesh well with electronic equipment. I mean that that's a given. I don't mesh well with electronic equipment either. I do know how to use it though. <laughs> well, I was gonna say you do better than I do. As I sit here and go, Katie. <gasps> Please tell me how to do this, Katie. I don't know what to do here, Katie. And then, you and then sit I have there to go, and you Tom, argue come with here. me that it's not working. I'm like, I just told you how to do it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You can tell me who can tell me, but it still doesn't work. I'm old. <laughs> Set in my ways. Set in your ways. Well, yeah. my mama yeah. had some funny banter that should make sense of what's coming in the next couple episodes because she does call me it a couple of times. Yeah, well, her dad and I went down to the storage unit to try to clean some of the shit out and brought up a truckload of boxes for Katie to go through. Now, Knowing my daughter well, I forced her out the door and made her stand there and go through every friggin' box to see what she wanted to keep and what she didn't. And she was doing good until something sparkly caught her attention. And she was like the friggin' Niffler from Fantastic Beasts. And she, ooh, ooh, and she put it in a pocket. And, ooh, ooh, put it in a pocket. I'm like, dude, you don't have that many friggin' pockets on you. Where are you storing this shit at? <laughs> She's horrible. Absolutely horrible. So, yes, we call her the Niffler now because anything shiny or of random memory in her mind, she just tucks it away in a pocket. And she had on, like, Spanx pants, so I don't know where the hell she was putting them at. Well, where were you storing it? Some of it was in your bra, wasn't it? Some of it was in my bra, I will say that. But I did have... Uh... It was Sphinx pants? What what pants did I have on? I thought I had on... You had active wear. They don't did have, have that act... big of pockets. I mean, yeah. the pocket that I have on this one right here goes all the way from like my hip down to my knee. Oh, that's a good pocket. That's a good pocket. <laughs> no, you had on jean shorts. Those, those fuckers have good pockets too. They're men's jean shorts. <laughs> well, that's probably why. Because mine are like, okay, you can get a quarter of an inch in and then you're fucked from there. Mm-hmm. That's exactly. why I was so happy when I got my 5.11s and I'm like, oh my God, my pockets go down to my kneecaps and I could scratch my knee. <laughs> yeah. Those are good pants. Oh yeah. Those are excellent so. pants. Those are the ones that you uh, desperately look for as a woman. To find oh God. Pockets. I don't know what the hell they think we don't want pockets. What the hell, man? Because I love we pockets. have purses. And you know what? All those men who have like the deep set pockets, what do they do? They hand their shit off to you to put Sh in your fucking yeah, purse. Exactly. I'm yeah, like, yeah. Unless, fucking not? <laughs> unless they're cargo pants, and then those are the men version of per, uh, purses. Yeah. Yeah. yeah then I do they that get to your dad. I'm like, here, carry this. I don't want to take my purse. Here, carry this. Yeah. <laughs> I do that a lot. Poor dude. That's only fitting. He does it to me. It's only fair. Yes, yes it is. But yeah. So the Niffler was active. Alive and well. She found a lot of good toys. Yes. Oh, yeah. found a lot of good things you hadn't seen in ages. And then, you know, we got into the, oh, 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 the, uh, what the hell is that thing called? Jacob's Ladder, whatever. Oh, the, the Jacob's Ladder. I mean, we yeah, talked about that later, and you'll realize when you get to that episode. But the way that my parents looked at each other, like, when they were doing this, because at first it started out with my mom and I trying to figure out how to do Jacob's Ladder and Cat's Cradle. And I am no help. I don't remember any of this. Anything previous to, like, 15 years is a blur. But <laughs> I'm watching her. And she's like, you got to grab this portion. You got to grab this one. Grab this one. I'm like, I'm sorry. And my dad's like, just take it from me. Just take it this. from me. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, her dad walks by and I'm like, baby, come here. You know how to do this shit. Get over here and show her how to do it. And she's like, no way. He knows how it's like, do, 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 do. off we go. We start playing. She's like, Fuck. this should be a prerequisite for anybody wanting to get married. You should be able to play Jacob's Ladder and all the Cat's Cradle stuff with your mate. Otherwise, you can't get married. <laughs> it's against the rules. Without yelling at each other, rules. too. 
Did we ever yell at each other? No. And in fact, my best friend, June, um, James actually hosts a couple episodes with us, and June has been on one. Um, she stated that your parents look so completely in love with each other, and it is so sweet. I'm like, absolutely. 100% of yep. the way. 34 years, man. Can't knock it. Nope. We've had good time. Now we got to move on and try something different. Retirement. Retirement. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, before anyway. you can move on and try something different, I've got a doozy of a case for you today. So, uh. while we understand that some individuals listen for the entertainment aspect of true crime, it's important to remember that these are real people with families and friends who may still be suffering from their loss. These stories are not meant to open old wounds, cause further emotional damage to those involved. We remind you to please be respectful, do not dox, or contact those involved with cases. The cases discussed in this podcast and on it may be disturbing to some listeners, and listener discretion is advised. So, as far as trigger warnings go today, we have sexual assault, Involves a minor and I don't think we get into animal abuse today, but it will be coming in the next couple parts. Let's go ahead and get started on this. On February 1st of 2012, on the side of a four-laned Tudor Road in Anchorage, Alaska, stood a small coffee kiosk named Common Grounds. Its blue paint and brown trim broke the silence of the white snowdrifts around it. On this night, Samantha Koenig had been working alone, closing up the store like any other barista would do after a long shift before heading home, when she disappeared without a trace. At 20 hundred hours, around 8 p.m., the owner of the Common Grounds coffee kiosk called the APD, the Anchorage Police Department, dispatch line, from Oregon, where he'd been vacationing, reporting that he'd seen an unknown man entering the window of the coffee kiosk. This video surveillance system that he had going showed Samantha giving this man money from the register and then leaving with him, noting that Samantha appeared to have been possibly abducted by this individual. Samantha's boyfriend, Dwayne, went to go pick her up at 20.33 hours, 8.33 p.m., to give her a ride home, but when he got to the stand, it appeared to be closed, and Samantha wasn't there, and the interior lights were off. Dwayne then proceeded to park and get out of his vehicle and go check through one of the windows to see that there were napkins, cleaning supplies, and wooden blocks that were used to keep the windows in place were actually in the window, like cells to keep it from opening. The place looked disheveled with napkins on the floor and cleaning rags still on the countertops. And Dwayne notes that this was very out of place for Samantha as she was very conscientious about being neat and tidy. So on February 2nd, the first of the baristas comes in for her opening shift at the small five by nine coffee kiosk when she feels something is off. Upon entering, she noticed what Dwayne had noticed the previous night. The place was left disheveled and napkins were strewn about and things had not appeared to be fully cleaned. She also realized that the previous day's profit had been taken. Knowing this not to be the way that Samantha regularly closed and even noting how she was typically a very meticulous closer, this barista contacts the authorities and reports her missing. When the Anchorage Police Department discover that Samantha is missing upon their arrival at the scene, they begin their initial report, which was basically looking into who she was as a person. She was a popular high school senior that sometimes would cut class. Samantha also didn't seem to belong to any type of clique at the school. She was really nice and typically got her along with like everybody. This left investigators with little to no leads regarding her disappearance. There's also discussion that Samantha may have possibly had a history with illicit substances, and according to the FBI vaults on this case, 
Samantha had a history of cocaine use, according to a redacted individual who was interviewed. She was back and forth between trying to get clean and relapsing at the time she disappeared. This statement is corroborated by multiple friends of hers at the time of her disappearance, stating that her recovery and relapse journey was a common theme. This caused detectives to begin theorizing about what may have occurred the night before. Had Samantha left of her own volition, or was she possibly kidnapped? With Samantha's age being 18 years old, lack of evidence at the scene, a rocky relationship with her boyfriend, and an unpressed panic button in the kiosk's security system, it made investigators shift to the ladder that she'd left willingly. Then again, she had left a message for her father earlier in the evening asking him to stop by the kiosk with dinner. So why would you do that if you were planning on running away? Bingo. Detective Monique Dahl was assigned this case. It was her first day working homicide. Dahl initially thought the same as many other investigators on the scene. A simple teenager who's mad at her boyfriend runs away. Unfortunately, this is a bias that surrounds most of the Anchorage Police Department as well as other police departments in the United States, leading to the reason behind the less than dead theory. FBI agent Stephen Payne heard about this case from a friend at the police department. Anchorage may have been a big city, but it runs like a small town. Word of mouth travels very quickly, and he became concerned about this case in the way that it may have been dismissed as a runaway for a missing person or a missing girl. So he offers Dahl his help on the investigation, but Dahl declines. Dahl later contacted him that evening, just before 8 p.m., wanting him to view the surveillance video from the kiosk. So we're going to run through kind of what's going on on each of these cameras real quick. Okay. So... The coffee kiosk surveillance video, channels one through four. Channel one shows a angled view towards what I would presume to be the front of the trailer and the hot bar. Hot bar means your espresso bar, and just to the right behind Samantha is the cash register and the cold bar, typically used for making frappuccinos, cold drinks, things that go in the blender. Then to the left is another counter with a syrup stand upwards towards the facing towards the bar, the hot bar. Channel two is basically an inner, inverted view of channel one, with the hot bar being just below to the left. Also to the left, you can see the service window, and just down a small walkway is the exit door. Channel three is a outside surveillance video, and it's outside the service window and it's aimed upwards to where I would presume you could see someone's face if they were driving up in a car. You can also see a parking lot to the left and across the street. Channel four is also outside, and it is the back door of the kiosk. There's a couple of trash cans to the left and possibly a snow drift behind those. Now, it's important for me to mention here that the video is very grainy, and also, those lights outside are causing some very high exposure to the camera, making things almost blindingly white and hard to see. This, of course, isn't helped by the snow in the surrounding area. So we're going to pause here for a moment, and we're going to watch the surveillance tape. So at the start of this video, it's just before 8 p.m., Samantha is inside and appears to be cleaning stations and preparing to shut down for the night as her shift ends at 8 p.m. At around the 13 second mark, you can see someone walk away from the parking lot at the middle top of channel three towards the shop. This man walks towards the kiosk and walks to the right off screen. At 39 seconds, Samantha appears to be called to the window or notices someone at the window. She seems relaxed and goes about making this individual's order, possibly making small talk with them as she does. At a minute and 58 seconds after she hands the drink off to the customer, Samantha quickly stands back with her hands up. 
What you can barely see in this video is that just inside the window, the individual is pointing a gun at her. Very quickly, Samantha proceeds to turn off the lights just behind her and then proceeds to walk to the back of the shop and turn off the last set of them while the man peeks in and watches her through the window. Now, you can kind of make out the shape of a hand at this point reaching through and touching the countertop. However, due to the quality of the video, this might just be my eyes playing tricks on me, but I'm not entirely sure. But if that is a hand, it's unclear if the individual may have grabbed something off the countertop or was just using it as support as they leaned through the window. Samantha then proceeds back to the window with her hands still up, and the two appear to converse for a moment. She walks to the back of the store again, appearing to sit something down below the window when she comes back like with a possible bag. At around the three minute and 50 second mark, Samantha goes to the register and empties it, placing the money just in front of the window too. And I presume it's possibly like I stated before, she set up a bag and she's like putting things into it. She then backs up and seats herself with her back against the syrup bar and watches this man. After a moment, Samantha then turns around and slides back towards the window, puts on a possible jacket, and places her arms behind her. At around the 5 minute and 19 second mark, the man leans halfway through the window and appears to restrain her. At the 6 minute and 41 second mark, you can see a group of people walking to their car on channel three, just in the upper left corner of the screen. They get into their car and idle for a little bit with people getting in and out of the vehicle, possibly wondering what's going on at the kiosk before they eventually take off at seven minutes and 41 seconds. As this car is driving away, the man then climbs through the window and begins to look around the store, stepping around Samantha as he does. He then appears to sit down next to Samantha, possibly talking to her or draping something over her, then proceeds to hoist her from the ground to her feet and then proceed to leave the kiosk. From the back door, channel four, you can see someone look directly at the camera for a moment. However, like I said earlier, due to the high exposure, it's hard to see too much detail. They quickly disappear from this camera, and a few moments later, they appear again on channel three, heading back towards that parking lot. The man is walking with an arm around Samantha's back towards this parking lot where he'd come from. At 10 minutes and 30 seconds, it looks as though someone took off running at the top portion of the screen on channel three towards a busy road on the right, but that's where the details of this footage end. There, video evidence on the surveillance footage of Samantha's boyfriend pulling up to the kiosk, driving around, and checking to see what's going on or happening is on the video, and it logs that he briefly stops at the window for about eight seconds, looks as if he's peering inside, and then he leaves. There's possibly a blind spot on the camera. However, it's not clear if he actually got out of his vehicle or not to actually check the kiosk. Payne didn't know what to make of this video, and again, he offered his help to Dahl, who once again declined. Detective Jeff Bell was also added to the investigation team at this point. He had 17 years of experience, and he too was puzzled by the video. One thing was for sure, the departments working this case theorized that this video, that Samantha was likely not a victim and they did not plan to go public with the information on this case. God, that's wild. Right? Samantha's father, James Sony Koenig, was standing outside the kiosk waiting for his daughter to begin her scheduled shift the following day from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. He had been up the previous night with worry, repeatedly calling her phone. This was his final hope that she'd show up for work, but she never did. Now, James has some questionable past life choices, and there's rumors of him being involved with crime circles in Alaska, predominantly the drug scene. James had different plans for his daughter's case after seeing the lack of response from the APD, and immediately started advocating for his missing child. 
It had been 48 hours since Samantha's disappearance, and James took to the streets rallying Anchorage citizens with flyers boldly titled in red ink, Kidnapped, and his daughter's photo placed under it. James was described as frantic and willing to talk to anyone about Samantha's case. He even went as far as to make a Facebook page in hopes of someone giving him information of his missing baby girl. The community flocked to James, taking flyers, volunteering their own time, and providing a shoulder to cry on when needed. Reporters eventually made their way to the scene to get more information on what was happening. James told them that he'd called Samantha's phone until it eventually died around noon. He also noted how the two of them talked regularly throughout the day, either by phone call or by text. For her to say nothing was not like Samantha. Come Saturday, the Anchorage Police Department had to play catch up to finding Samantha with the growing anger of the Anchorage community now breathing down their necks. Press conferences were held on Samantha's case and under public pressure for answers behind the mysterious disappearance, they released part of the surveillance video from the Common Grounds kiosk. All that could be said of the suspect in the video was that he was tall in comparison to Samantha, who stood at five foot five inches height. This left many individuals to fall within the category of the possible suspect, including James and Duane. Dahl interrogated both James and Duane separately. In her notes regarding James, she made the comment that he was straightforward and brutally honest. Dahl was perplexed by the information the two had given her, though. Duane, or Samantha's boyfriend, told Dahl about how he'd gone to pick Samantha up from the kiosk at around 8.30 p.m. He had been running late from his own job. When he arrived at the kiosk, it was dark and empty. Out of fear of the security system being active and set, he refrained from going inside to look further into what was going on. Dahl made the comment regarding the two's relationship and how it had seemed to be on the rocks upon going through text messages. Dwayne didn't deny this, and he was very open about the fact that he had been flirting with other girls and that Samantha obviously didn't like that. He'd also mentioned how he'd tried calling her earlier in the evening when she had disappeared while she was at work, and when she said that she couldn't talk, he responded with whatever and hung up the phone. A text came in later that evening around 11.30 p.m. from Samantha to him saying, F you asshole. I know what you did. I am going to spend a couple of days with friends. Need time to think, plan, acting weird. Let my dad know. Dahl pried at this message, but Duane insisted that he had nothing to do with her disappearance, and he went home to James when Samantha wasn't at the kiosk. He waited up, hoping that she would come home that evening, but she never did. At 11.53, another text message came in from Samantha's phone to Dwayne saying, F you. Dwayne then told Dahl that for some reason at around 3 a.m., he had a weird sensation to open the front door. And when he did, he noticed a man going through his and Samantha's truck. Now, the two had shared this truck between each other, and they kept basically, like, the insurance driver's licenses and things in there just to like save on time, I guess. But the two men stared at each other for a minute before the man closed the truck door and walked away down the street. Duane relayed what he saw to James and at approximately 1400 hours, Duane came out to search the vehicle. So at 2 PM the following day, Samantha's ID was gone from the visor over the steering wheel. And during the interview, he notes that nothing else was taken. This interview left Dahl with more questions than answers and a now growing suspicion of both Duane and James, as information failed to line up. By that evening, Dahl had actually sent two officers to the residence to see how the two would react to a drop-by visit. According to the officers, James wedged himself through the front door and closed it behind him when they talked. 
they then asked to talk to, to Dwayne, and James entered the house the same way that he'd exited, and Dwayne followed suit, exiting through a small wedge and closing the door behind him. Curiosity and suspicion now growing, Dahl placed a bell on James to survey his every move around the clock. So James made a Facebook post on February 4th stating, if you would like to donate to the reward fund to rescue Samantha Tesla Koenig, you can do so by donating to any Danali Alaskan credit union and using the account number. Or I also have a PayPal account set up. So go to paypal.com and enter my email address, all lowercase, all proceedings go to the rescue efforts and reward to anyone that can return her home to me safely and unharmed. This account is also a living trust account with only Samantha and her father on the account and able to access the funds. On February 5th, a Mirandaized interview was held with an unnamed source regarding a drug operation that may have been occurring around Samantha's network of friends or family. It's undisclosed which, but it may have garnered the kidnapping and holding of ransom until the bill was paid for said illicit substances. Another person came forward with information regarding the concern that there was more emphasis being placed on the reward funds rather than the safe return of Samantha. On the 8th of February, James posted again to his Facebook page stating, whoever has my daughter, just bring her anywhere to a hospital, home, send her in a cab home anonymously, and I will leave all the money we have collected in a certain place of your choosing within minutes of your instructions. Just send her home to me. Days went by and there was no movement in the case. By the following Saturday, February 11th, a candlelit vigil was held for Samantha. Hundreds of people turned out for it, including the press, Nancy Grace, ABC, NBC, CNN, and Fox News all aired coverage on her case. Samantha's father continued to advocate for her and started to put together reward money as information for any information regarding Samantha. Facebook messages poured into Samantha's page with some ranging as far as New Zealand. Payne during this time contacted many travel networks to see if she had left the country or the state, but there was nothing. Additionally, her phone had not pinged again since the night of her disappearance. On February 14th, a call was received from a woman that James had made a threat to earlier in the day. Her daughter had been making t-shirts with Samantha's face on them and selling them for $10. $5 of these proceedings was to remain with her to help her recoup for her time and efforts with this expenditure, and the other five was to go to the proceedings of helping to raise money for the reward of Samantha's safe return or any information regarding her. When the woman contacted James regarding collecting the half owed to her daughter's efforts, James refused to hand over the funds and stated, if you make one more t-shirt with Samantha's face on it, I will kill you. The woman also discloses how James seemed obsessive with the reward money, at times checking the same donation jar several times a day. On February 16th, James posted again on the Facebook page stating, please find it in your heart to help Samantha. Even if you come to me, I will guarantee your safety and set you up with enough money to leave the state and start anew somewhere of your choosing. As long as the result is her returning to me safe and unharmed, anything less I will devote my life and resources to hunting down the individuals responsible for stealing my life away from me. Nearly two weeks later, on February 24th, at 7.56 p.m. Duane got the shock of a lifetime when a text came into his phone from Samantha's number. Connor Park, under pick of Albert. Ain't she pretty? Ugh. Ugh. Nasty. <laughs> Duane and James quickly shared the message with the APD and were off to Connor Park. Under the poster of a missing dog named Albert was a Ziploc bag containing a ransom photo and Polaroid photos of Samantha. Now, if you want to see this, 
I do have the photo. It is posted in the Discord. I've seen it one too many times. Oh, God. I remember this. <laughs> the light bulb's on. <laughs> God, it's so... It's, it's even more disturbing, you know, knowing what happened. But, of course, the people listening mm-hmm. don't know what happened yet. Or maybe they do. No... They're, they're about, they're about to, to learn. To learn. Oh Actually, we get more into that in part they're two. They're about to but learn. But it's coming. Oh, my gosh. Now, oh. this ransom note demanded $30,000 be deposited into Duane's bank account, making mention of the ATM card Samantha had when she had gone missing. I may not use the card much in AK due to the small pop. But I'll be leaving soon, so I will be using it all over. The case was now officially a kidnapping, a federal crime, meaning the FBI, specifically Payne, had jurisdiction over the case now. A task force was formed consisting of Jolene Godin, who had years of experience with crimes against children, human trafficking, sex trafficking, homicide, and working against rapists as well as serial killers. Kat Nelson was a younger investigator, by all accounts, was a person who became electrified by the work that bored others. Shifting through digital footprints, credit card transactions, phone records, and other realms of forensic data, structure, and narratives. The next step was deciding on depositing the ransom into the account, It was no secret that James was gathering and broadcasting the reward money. However, he was hesitant to deposit the sum, which made people grow even more suspicious of his motives. It was February 29th when James contacted the APD, informing investigators that he would be depositing an amount that they agreed upon, $5,000, enough to withdraw from and aggravate the person into making contact again for more. Detective Joseph Barth was tasked with monitoring the card for any activity. Samantha's card had pinged the night of her disappearance. However, there was less than $5 in the account, so there's nothing really worth withdrawing. The next ping came in at real time for Barth just four hours after James had deposited the sum into the account. The card was being used to make a withdrawal at a bank in Ingrid, Anchorage for $600 to be exact. This was declined, though, due to the daily limit being set at $500 for withdrawals. This was definitely suspicious to investigators. It seemed like there was too much coincidence with the date and who all knew about this plan taking place and the money being put into the bank. The only people who knew outside of the investigators that this was happening were Duane and James. Two hours later, a second ping came in, just six minutes from the first bank. This time, the withdrawal was successful, with $500 being taken out. Then, just before midnight, came a set of back-to-back withdrawal attempts. Then, a half hour later, a successful withdrawal attempt for another $500. Investigators noted that this individual was a fast learner, grabbing cash at the midnight line, would allow the individual to grab upwards to $1,000 if done correctly. And how this location had some distance from the last one at a Denali credit union. Unfortunately for the suspect, this credit union had a working camera on the ATM. However, it would take days for the surveillance footage to get to the FBI from the bank. When the surveillance footage came back, it was given to Chris Iber, a specialist in video analysis at the FBI. He noted that despite the man wearing baggy clothes, he was athletically built. He wore a hoodie with a paint stain on the left chest area, and on the back was the letters C-O-R-P-S. This led Payne to theorize that maybe this individual had been in the Marines at some point, or maybe he still was. Additionally, this man was wearing a light-colored set of eyeglasses, a gray face mask, dark pants, and a light or white-colored shoes. 
Investigators were now also in possession of the Home Depot security video, which they hoped would give them more information on what could have possibly happened after the two had walked off camera. When they walk out of frame, the two can be seen crossing the street. While the light is changing, Samantha broke away from the man. It was very clear now that her hands had been tied behind her back as she ran in a complete panic away from her attacker. The man then proceeds to tackle her to the ground, stand her back upright, and continue walking over towards a white truck. He waits a moment before placing her into the vehicle as a few people mosey about, to which I share the same thought as Payne did in this moment. Do not let him take you to a second location. Scream, do something. After this group dissipates, the man then proceeds to place Samantha into the truck, close the door, and calmly walk over and get into the driver's seat and drive away. Now, I did want to note that this video was received the same day as the ransom note. However, it's unclear if it was viewed the same day or if it was held off due to some commotion over the ransom note happening. At 10.30 p.m. on March 7th, the ATM card pinged again. However, it was now in an unexpected location, the lower 48 states. In fact, it was a $400 withdrawal from Wilcox, Arizona, right off the I-10 corridor. The next withdrawal was in Lordsburg, New Mexico, just an hour's drive from Wilcox. It was now apparent that the individual was heading east on I-10. However, whoever this was made the mistake of trying to withdraw more than the daily amount again, presumably getting confused with time differences between like Anchorage and the lower 48 states. The account was still set for Alaskan time, which it was currently 1134, while in New Mexico, it's currently 234 a.m. The card pinged again a minute later with a balance inquiry requested. $3,598.81 was still in the account. Another minute passed and there was another ping for an $80 withdrawal, just barely grazing the daily limit. With this information now available, along with some idea of what the suspect might be wearing and what car he might be driving, Payne put out a be on the lookout for suspect, sending this information to law enforcement in New Mexico, California, Arizona, and Texas. On March 12th, Stephen Rayburn, a Texas Ranger, received the BOLO, and it read, Reference, kidnapping suspect, Koenig, Samantha. Suspect will be a unknown male, last seen wearing a light-colored hooded sweatshirt. Suspect vehicle will be newer, light-colored passenger car. Based on ATM transactions, it's believed that the suspect is traveling east towards El Paso. By 10.58 a.m. that morning, Rayburn became the lead on the case and the card had been pinged once again in Humble and Shepherd, Texas. Rayburn called the FBI office trying to get more information to put together a thorough bulletin for his rangers to watch out for. Chris Eiber had done most of the work on the surveillance video and using methods of ratio sizing of known objects to unknown obje objects in the video, he pinned the car as being a white Ford Focus. Rayburn sent out a more detailed bulletin and a photo of a white Ford Focus attached to it. On 2-1-2012, at approximately 2 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, the victim was kidnapped in the state of Alaska at her place of employment. Her family and boyfriend have since been cleared as suspects. On 3-7-2012, a debit card in the name of the victim's boyfriend, Duane, was used at a ATM in Wilcox, Arizona at approximately 10.15 a.m. The card was again used in Lordsburg, New Mexico at approximately 11.30 a.m. The card was last used in Shepherd, Texas at 
3-12-2012 at approximately 2.47 a.m. Shepard is located on US 50. Officers are asked to check rest areas, truck stops, and motels. Officers are asked to be on the lookout for the vehicle with the occupant matching suspect or victim description. Suspect should be in possession of redacted stolen ATM card, which they use Dwayne's last name. And here we go. To quote Ashley Flowers, because this was the first time I heard this case was on Crime Junkie. Thank God for the ranger who showed up to work that day. Amen. Corporal Brian Henry, a Texas highway patrolman, was about to go on his lunch break when he noticed a white Ford Focus parked off of US 59 at a Quality Inn. He decided to wait around until Rayburn could arrive to the scene with FBI agent Deb Ganaway in tow. Upon arriving, Rayburn and Ganaway examined the car, noticing the barcode number from the back rear window, a rental, and the clothing of a little girl in the back seat. It was parked in front of room 115 with 215 right above it. Rayburn ordered eyes on the vehicle in those two doors. However, the likelihood that their suspect was in one of these rooms could be low due to the open parking lot for guests. Then, at 11.30, a adult white male exited room 215. He removed items from the room and placed them into the white Ford Focus. Rayburn told Henry to set up on US 59 and that he needed to find a reason to pull that car over. He set up in the central median so he'd have the perfect unobscured view of the quality in and followed the Ford Focus as it pulled out of the parking lot and started making its way down the road. Stopping at a traffic light, there was no reason yet to pull the individual over as he hadn't done anything wrong. When the light turned green, however, the car accelerated to 57 miles per hour, which was two miles per hour over the legal speed limit. Bingo! Henry switched on his lights and calmly pulled the driver over. Walking over to the car, Henry noticed the man was in his mid-30s and wore a black wraparound pair of sunglasses. Texas Highway Patrol, he stated. Where are you from? Alaska, the man responded. In 22 years of working, Henry had never pulled over an Alaskan in Texas. He asked the man for his license and to step out of the vehicle, to which the man calmly obliged, getting out of his vehicle and handing him his ID, an Alaskan ID with the information of Israel Keys, born January 7th, 1978. And that's where we're going to end part one. Ah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. God. What a fucking psycho. Oh, right? You're just t- hitting the tip of the ice. You're just, you just, you're you're just dipping your toes in the water, okay? <laughs> go, for, go for a little oh. swim. <laughs> yeah. No. no. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> But I have to, and I'm not trying to be a devil's advocate or anything like this. He really is fascinating how his mind works. Oh, absolutely. His mind is freaking insane on how it works and just the meticulousness yes. that he puts into and that we will get into when we're discussing him is absolutely fucking mind-blowing. It is. It really is. I mean... I had a little idea after reading one of the books, but diving into the FBI files and then some was like, holy crap. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, I don't have any numbers for you guys yet, but we will have some coming up in part three, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Stay tuned for that, but welcome into the four part series of Israel Keys.
Thank you again for listening to Spattered. Please make sure to follow the show on Facebook and Instagram at Spattered Podcast or on Twitter at Spattered Pod. Be sure to follow and rate the show on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts from. If you're watching on YouTube, please make sure to hit that like button, ring that notification bell, and smash that follow button. As always, if you have a story request, any questions, or are interested in sponsoring the show, please email me at spatteredpodcast at gmail.com. Spattered is a true crime podcast hosted by Caitlin Gardner. The research for this episode was done by Caitlin Gardner and Jill Lynn Gardner. All of the edits for this episode were done by Caitlin Gardner. All of the music for the show comes from Lucio Cardenas, James Hansen, and Caitlin Gardner. A special thanks to our guest co-hosts today, Jill Lynn Gardner and Sarah Ray. We'll see you next time. Stay safe out there. <laughs>